description. I spent about two, three Sundays just talking about the gifts of the Spirit themselves. Now we're getting into some descriptions. Last week, I talked about the uh, administration. Uh, and then uh, and I gave you an example of a good uh, administrator, Pastor Martha, who uh, uh, someone who leads and, and sets things up. But more importantly, they get things together for the vision that's been cast so that the, the church can get with the vision and move along according to the vision. Nothing worse, a couple of things in a church. Number one, nothing worse than not having a vision at all. If you don't know why you exist and what you're doing or why you're there, then you're just, you're just taking up space. Number two, nothing worse than having a vision but never going toward it. So you have to, now, number one, have a vision. Know, in other words, know what mission God has given you, what your mission is. And, you know, so often you find people who are saying, oh, man, you know, everybody should be like us. Well, no, I don't want everybody to be like us. This is our mission. They have their own mission. Complete your mission. We'll complete ours. And when it's all said and done, we'll look back and we'll see that it was important that each one complete their mission, their distinct missions, because that all together, uh, brought all together, meant the plan of God was operational and was moving ahead. And uh, nothing worse than the plan of God not happening in an area simply because a church or congregation is not fulfilling their mission. So this is why we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit, so you know what your gifts are. And your gifts, I want to reiterate this, your gifts are for the body of Christ, for the house of God, and to bring glory to God. Because they must bear fruit. Amen? All right. Now, I start out with this verse. I, I gave this verse last week, and I want to give it again. Acts 13, 1, 2, and 3. It says, Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manea, who had, brought up, who had been brought up rather, with uh, Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, we know him as Paul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, and we talked about what ministering to the Lord and fasting meant, they, were, they weren't petitioning God, they were ministering, they were blessing, they were worshiping. All right, we talked quite a bit about that. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit said, in the midst of that, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So even though Paul and Barnabas knew what God had called them to do, they didn't move until their leadership, those in charge, had laid hands on them and blessed them. And then in this case, they were sent out. In our case, many of our cases, it's to be, to be let loose in the church and in the body to do the work or to exercise the gift that God has given us. And I think that's very, very important because a lot of times what people do is say, well, I'm just going to do this. And it could be counter, counter even though it's a, some things look good, but it could be something that is uh, counteracting what the mission of the church is. So we have to make sure that our gifts and, and how we're operating them line up with the mission of the ministry. Because if it doesn't line up with the mission of the ministry, then you're off doing something over here, and the church is going this way, and you're going over that way. And, and, and so your portion ought to be with them to move everything ahead, but it's not because you're doing that. And, and, and to our discredit, as far as pastors, to our discredit, we have let people just go off and do their own thing rather than focus their energies, focus their gift into the main line, uh, mainstream of the ministry uh, and our mission or our focus so that we all work together. And when we all work together, it's like anything else. If you're in the military and you're going, going at, to take a hill or, or, or whatever, take a, you know, this particular area, you have to work together and coordinate your attack to take that area. Otherwise, if everybody goes off and do their own thing, you get picked off and you die and then you never accomplish the objective. And the main goal is to accomplish the objective. Not to see, well, you know, I did this and I did that. It's, it's not about what you did. In fact, let me, let me share this with you. As we talk about all these gifts, number, one of the things that's gonna happen is you are not gonna necessarily be highly appreciated for your gift. But I can tell you this, God's gonna appreciate you. He's gonna appreciate the fact that you did what you were supposed to do. He appreciates the fact that you uh, fulfilled your calling. He's going to appreciate the fact that you brought it in in line with the mission of the church that you're in and moved along in, in, in that stream. He's going to appreciate that because you're able to get a lot more things done. When everybody is like buckshot in a, from a shotgun, you know, you got to pump 12 gauge and you 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 know you pull the trigger and it goes up in, the, in in a short distance. It's pretty lethal. 
But then as it goes, keeps going along and along, guess what happens? That buckshot begins to travel outward and outward, becomes less effective and less effective and less effective. And a lot of times that's what happens in churches. We just kind of pull the trigger and everybody kind of goes. And in the beginning, it looks great because, hey, man, look at what we're doing. Hey, okay, we got this going on. But over a period of time, it just you scatter off this way and some go off that way, some go off that way. And before you know it, you become less effective. And you, can, and you know it yourself. You can think, you, you know of churches yourself as you think about it. Uh, years ago that maybe you were in a church or heard of a church or whatever the man started off great guns and they may still be going on at the church is still active don't get me wrong but but they're not effective any longer they're no longer affecting the neighborhood they're no longer affecting the community they're no longer affecting the body of Christ like they did at one time because now they they're, they're everything is so scattered off instead of focused in on the mission you, you, you see what I'm saying? I can, I can think of several churches that way that at one time were, were huge. And, and not number-wise, I'm talking about as an impact in Christianity. Had great impact. But then as time went on, somehow, some way, they lost their focus. And it becomes imperative that we keep our focus. And the gifts that the people have in the ministry are, are, are lined up with the vision. And so that we can then focus all those on that vision. And then we get that vision taken care of. That thing begins to, it begins to happen. I think I read a scripture last week where it said, where God told him um, to write the vision down. Write it down and then run with, run with it. Run with what? The vision. Run with the vision. Not run and do your own thing, but run with the vision. That becomes important, all right? I don't want to talk that long about that, but just to help, help you understand, everything, it has to line up together. It's not, a, you know, I, I remember in, in old church, they used to say, well, just find something to do, with, to keep your hands busy and just do it in the church. Well, that's fine, but it's better if you find your gift and then operate your gift in the ministry. Amen? Operate your gift in that ministry under your leaders, under the leadership of the people who God has placed over you because they can help you and guide you in the operation of your gift. And they know because they have the vision and they know what God, is, what, what God wants them to go and what God wants them to do. And so they know how to use your gift then in line with where they're going. It becomes important. Amen? All right, all right. I know we live in a world and we live in a country where, you know, it's do your own thing, do whatever you, you know, do your thing, do whatever you want to do and all that kind of business, but that's the world. That's not us. You know, that's not us. We, 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 we have to line, if the apostles have to line up with Jesus, we have to line up with one another here in the body of Christ. Amen. All right, so now let's talk about the apostolic because I think, uh, and I'm kind of going alphabetical order if you didn't get that administrative apostolic, so... Uh, let's go apostolic. Uh, in Ephesians 4, it says, 4, verse 11 and 12, it says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So what's their, what, what is their purpose? For the equipping of the saints, so the saints can do what? Serve. Did you see that? For the, w w here again, there's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. We call them the, uh, the ministerial gifts. That's what we call them. They're the, the you might call them the fab five. <laughs> All right. And their job is to do what? Equip the saints so the saints can then serve and they build up the body of Christ. So they, we, uh, my job is to equip you so you can serve in the house of God. I got three, four, and one more. Can I get five amens? <laughs> All right. Amen lights, amen carpet. All right. Because, and, and it's important we understand that. It's important we understand that. All right. And then it says uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers of the miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. And that's 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Then he goes on to say, are all apostles, all prophets. Everybody that, everybody's not one. There's a variety of gifts and, and so forth. And, and so uh, uh, let, me, let, me start out by, let me start out by addressing an issue that's still alive in the church, and that is, are there apostles today? Are there apostles today? Because some tend to think, and I understand where they're coming from, so I don't want to disparage their, their thinking. Uh, some tend to think, well, there were only the 12 apostles, and that's it. All right? Well, if you, if you look at it from that perspective, then there was, you know, the original 12, including Judas Iscariot. But then Paul later on says he's an apostle. And then there are other apostles listed in the New Testament. 
In fact, I, somebody did the math and, and figured out and counted, and they said there was all together, including the 12, they counted in the New Testament like 28. Those uh, 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 considered, they were considered apostles. Barnabas was considered an apostle. All right, so here you have all these other apostles. So, you know, and, and then the argument goes, well, in the early church, there were apostles to get the church started. Once the church got started, then there was no need for the apostolic ministry anymore. But my problem is Ephesians 4 then, because in Ephesians 4 it says he gave some apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Well, some folks don't believe there's prophets today, okay? Uh, but we all believe there's an evangelist. Every single one of us, all throughout. I don't care what denomination you're in. They have, and any, I don't care what denomination it is, there's some evangelists in those denominations. So we all believe there's still evangelists. Obviously, we all believe there's still pastors and teachers. So in, in, some, in some arenas, they leave out the apostles and prophets saying those offices no longer exist. But here's my problem then. My problem is if God says so in Ephesians 4 that there are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, well, if there's no more apostles and prophets, then there are no more evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But if there's still evangelists, pastors, and teachers, I don't think we can discount the fact that there still are prophets and apostles. Now, this is why I understand where it comes from. Turn your Bibles real quick to Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. And it says, and he carried me, talk, this is Paul, I mean, not Paul, this is John speaking. He says, and he carried me in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now, this is not Jerusalem as we know it, the new Jerusalem. This is the new Jerusalem, coming down out of, uh, uh, out of, uh, out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates. Hmm. And at the gates, 12 angels. And names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. So now the 12 tribes' names are written on the gates, right? There were three gates on the east, three on the, gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So now... I understand where the idea of the apostleship is no longer valid because there were only 12 apostles of the Lamb. That's it. No more than 12. And, because, and obviously, let me, let me share this with you, Judas Iscariot's name is not on one of the foundation stones. He lost his. I believe that the 12th name now is Paul's. Now, I know they picked another one in the upper room, uh, was Matthias. But I believe, actually, Jesus picked his own, repla uh, Judas's replacement, and that was on the road to Dam Damascus when he confronts Paul, and Paul falls off the horse and is blinded and so forth and so on, and, and, and he's called into ministry from that point and we and we see the marvelous story of how that all unfolds how everything comes together and uh and and, and so there's no doubt in my mind uh, and it, i'm not saying this is 100 percent right i'm just simply saying no doubt in my mind that paul was actually jesus replacement for that vacant position all right but there's only 12 apostles of the lamb that's it but there's still an apostolic office all right, so and, there, and therein lies the difference. The apostles of the Lamb are 12, that's it, that is a finite number, no more. But there is an apostolic office that still exists, and that office still exists today. There's a prophetic office that still exists, and that office still exists today. There's obviously an evangelistic office that exists, and it still exists today. We know that pastoral or elder or bishop all means the same uh, uh, office that exists. It exists today. Teachers, that office of teacher, it still exists today. Those offices still exist, each and every single one. He gave those offices, here again, for what? For the equipping of the saints for service. So it's the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers' job to equip you so that you can serve in the ministry. And never, whatever capacity God has for you and whatever gifting he's given you, so you use that gift for the service of of the Lord and I'm emphasizing the service of the Lord because that's the only way you will bear fruit 
is when you use your gift of the Holy Spirit to serve in the kingdom. If it's used to serve outside the kingdom, it does not bear gift, uh, bear fruit. You hear what I'm saying? All right. So we see here again, the original 12 are the apostles of the Lamb, minus Judas Iscariot, a replacement, I believe, is Paul. That's just what I believe. Uh, and, and, and so there are the foundation stones of the new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven. Their names are written there for all eternity, for everyone to see. They are those guys. But that, that doesn't mean the apostolic office ceased to exist. It just simply means there's only 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the Bible specifically calls them that. Now the rest, for myself and others who are in that office, then we are in the apostolic office, uh, not th one of those guys, but still, I mean, it's still a great calling. Now what is an apostle? So let me go on now to tell you what an apostle does uh, so we can move along. Um, uh, these, these apostles use their faith to establish and grow churches or multiple churches. That's part of what they do. And, and, and it, it, kind of like evangelism, except not just to get people saved, but to actually grow a ministry, get that ministry established, get it moving, give it direction, give it vision, and then they do this on maybe multiple occasions. That's what some apostles do. Um, they also have a long-range vision. An apostle, uh, those in the apostolic office, are going to have a long-range vision that many times and most times go beyond their lifetime. It goes beyond their lifetime. So, and, and so uh, any church, and, and let, me, let me share this with because I've seen this happen too. And maybe you haven't, but I know I have, I've seen this, where the leader of a church passes away. He dies. And the church falls apart. The church falls apart. Well, what happened there? Why did, that, why, why did that happen? That happened because several reasons. Number one, there were no leaders who were raised up to step in his place. Number two, it happened because the vision was, he was the vision and not what God had declared. Now, let, let me explain that. What I mean by that is, as long as he was alive, the vision could be alive. But then when he died, the vision kind of dies with him because there's nobody to step up, take the place, and, and do the work necessary to keep that vision going. That's why it's important to have gifts operating in the church. That's why it's important to have these offices and, and other gifts uh, functioning and functioning well in the church because guess what? Each one of us is expendable. Can I say that again? Every single one of us is expendable. If you have a vehicle and a part goes bad, do you go and junk the vehicle? What do you do? You replace the part. We are parts in God's vehicle. And if your health fails, you die, whatever the case may be, maybe it's your time. There, we have to then replace the part. We'll give you a good send-off, but we're going to replace you. Same thing with me. Something that happens to me, guess what? Don't be, oh, man, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to keep going. You will, re you will replace me. You have to. You're supposed to. Because a person is more important. I mean, excuse me, the vision is more important than the person. The kingdom is more important than the person. The ministry doesn't stop and go with a person. The ministry keeps going. That's why I'm telling you that the vision goes normally beyond, for those in apostolic office, the vision they have goes beyond their lifetime. There are some churches right now that have been operating for the last two, three generations on the same vision because the, the, the original founder of the church had a vision and the pastor that came after him continued that vision and one that came after him is continuing that vision and it keeps going because the vision outlasted the founder. It's supposed to. It's supposed to. You got, but you have to know the vision. Henry Ford had a vision. Anybody know what it was? To make cars. No, that wasn't his vision. You know what his vision was? To put a car in every person's garage. That every person, Rick knows this better than I do, because he's a car guy. <laughs> To put, a, put every, the average American into a car. See, there were already car makers before Henry Ford came along. Henry Ford didn't invent the car. Otto Benz did over in Germany in 1880-something. 
Henry Ford just took the idea of the internal combustion engine in the car and said, hmm, how can I make this better? And affordable. And so that's what he did. He made it better and affordable. He took Otto Benz's, Mercedes Benz, Otto Benz, same guy. He took, <laughs> he took his vision and now he ran with it. Write the vision and run with it. He ran with it. And his vision was, aha, now not only a car, but let's make it, more, make it affordable and let's make it so that average person can purchase one. And that's exactly what he did. He came up with the um, mass production on a vehicle, the, the, with the, the assembly line. He came up with that idea because that was, you know, way to make the car a little cheaper. And he came, all these, all these things. Now, when did he, I'm not sure, I don't remember when Henry Ford died. You, Rick, you know when Henry Ford died? You're supposed to know this. No, I'm just, <laughs> but, but Henry Ford is no longer with us. He's been dead. And which, which Ford is it now? I know one, one of the Fords is head of the, it's the third, this is the third one. Is it Henry Ford the third or something? Okay, Henry Ford, the, see, I knew he knew. Died in 1947, and yet here it is, 2018, and there's still a Ford Motor Company. Because guess what? When he died, the plant didn't shut down. It didn't fall apart. Everybody didn't go home and say, well, that's it. I guess it's over. It kept going. And, 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 and in fact, they, that, that's right. They're not still making Model A's and Model T's. They're making all kind of new cars, all kind of different things. And in fact, they've taken the vision, refined it and everything, but it's still the same vision. To make a car affordable so everybody can have one. And they've refined that vision down. And so here we are, 2018, going to 2019. And man, guess what? That vision is still alive. Still alive. I bet you, I, I don't know, but I bet you in the boardroom and all around there, they probably have all kind of sayings of Henry Ford to, keep, keep, to help them understand that this is, this is what it's all about, folks. This is what it's all about. Well, in the church, it's the same way. Why is it that I, there was a church in Detroit, I, I'll never forget, I, I won't call the name, but uh, uh, the church in Detroit, the pastor died and the whole church fell apart. Huge church. And they, I mean, it, it got down to nothing simply because the pastor died. That's, that's ludicrous. That's ridiculous. That's insane. That's absolutely insanity. There should have been somebody he developed. See, because part of a, 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 the apostle's uh, task they are leaders of leaders. They raise up and develop other leaders. And if you're not developing and raising up other leaders, then something's wrong with you. See, you ought to always, listen to me very carefully, you ought to always be preparing your replacement. You ought to always be training your replacement, getting the person. So maybe that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to replace you, but the bottom line is you're training them to be, if necessary, if it comes down to it, they can step right in your shoes. They can step in and do what you do. They won't do it the same because you're a unique individual, but at least they have the ability to continue to, to push the thing forward and to keep it going. Because that's what the apostolic, those in the apostolic ministry do. They are leaders of leaders. They not only train and develop leaders, but they also lead other leaders. Not because they're so much better, they're so smart, only because they have, been, they have a gifting. And remember, all these are gifts of the Spirit, not a natural gift, not a natural inclination you have, but it's a gift of the Spirit. I cannot stand before you and preach the gospel because I have a, a natural ability to do that. No, that's ridiculous. I can tell you, I usually didn't speak this eloquently. You should have called me back. You should have knew me when. You probably wouldn't have liked to know me at, at, back in those days. But God gifted me to be able to minister his word, his way to you. He's gifted me in the apostolic arena to be able to raise up other leaders and train other leaders. Even as a pastor, you ought to be training other leaders. You ought to be training administrators. You ought to be training those that, in, in other areas. Doesn't mean you have to know all about those areas, but you're training them to be leaders. See, I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that you don't necessarily have to know a thing, but if you are gifted as a leader, you're able to lead men to do that thing that needs to be done.
George S. Patton was a gifted leader. World War II, General George S. Patton, for those who don't know who he is. Gifted leader. His men would follow him anywhere. If he said, we're going into the heart of Germany and we're going to kill Adolf Hitler ourselves, they'd have been, let's go. He was a gifted leader. Now, he, he didn't know, and he was, he was, he, he, he was, he was over at tanks. The, I, I'm not sure what it's called, but he, you know, he had tanks. <laughs> he was a tank guy. <laughs> like Rick's a car guy, he was a tank guy. And, and, and man, I'm telling you, they took those tanks any and everywhere, and, and I mean, they were just, uh, but his men were just, just like, hey, if he's going, I'm going. If he's going, I'm going. You ever see the movie Patton? Anybody ever see the movie? If you saw the movie, in the movie, there was a plane, they, they were, they, they, the planes came, and they were shooting at, his, at the camp, and he stood there, pulled out, it. he carried pearl, two pearl-handled six guns. Pearl-handled silver. <laughs> What a, what a character. And he pulls those things, and the plane is coming, shooting. And he pulls those things out, and he boom, 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 boom. He's shooting at the plane. I mean, this guy, he, he, didn't, he just didn't, he, him and Douglas MacArthur, and there were several others, just didn't think they could die. They weren't afraid. They had no fear. Douglas MacArthur, came, you know, they were leaving the Philippines. They were shooting at him, and he's standing and stopped talking about, well, okay, I guess we got to leave now, and let's go do this and that. And, he, and bullets are whizzing by him. And his guys are like ducking and saying, come on, get down. He said, come on, let's, let's just do what we got to do. And that's when he gave the famous I shall return thing, you know. Gifted leaders who win his men, their men saw them, saw how they operated under pressure, said, I'll follow this guy anywhere. I don't care where he's going, that's where I'm going. If he says, this, if we're going to the moon, I don't know how we're going to get there, but he's going to get us to the moon. Those are given, and I, I believe those in leadership in the ministry have to, have, have to be that same way. We have, to have, we have to have courage. That's one of the things I wrote down. That, um, did I write that down? Yeah. They, no, I guess I didn't. Oh, man. I was thinking about it last night. I don't know why I would. Oh, well, I did write this down. They would take risk and step out into the unknown. In other words, they have courage to step out when they don't know what's out there, but they're going to step into it anyway. And especially in the apostolic office, that's what, that's what you, have, you, have to, you have to step out into the unknown. You have to take risk. You have to say, hey, this is what God is telling me to do, and I don't understand it. I don't even see it, but guess what? Come on, folks. This is where we're going. Can you imagine Moses? My goodness, Moses, he's telling, he's telling the people in slavery, he's saying, God has sent me to tell you, let's go. It's time to go. We, we're leaving out, you're leaving out of this place. And then when it got harder for them, they griped and complained, oh, Moses, why don't you get out of here, Moses, man, you're making it hard. Because that's what people are. They don't see. See, they don't have the vision. They don't see. All they see was in front of them. And it takes the man with the vision to say, don't look at what's in front of you. Look beyond that because, see, there's, there's, a, there's a promised land beyond this. There's a promised land over across on the other side of the crest. There's a promised land on the other side of the hill, on the other side of the desert. There's a promised land. Don't look at the fact that you're making bricks without straw now. Yeah, you're going to endure that for a moment. But listen, if you just stick with it, there's a promised land on the other side. Because you never get to a promised land without going through some deserts and some trials and tribulations and difficulties. But it takes the leader to be able to say, hey, this is what's over there. The leader can't say, man, I don't know what we're going to do. What? Wait, what, 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 what? I don't know what we're going to do. Nobody wants to hear that from a leader. Nobody, nobody wanted to hear that from Moses. If Moses would say, hey, folks, I just thought I'd bring you together and tell you we're out in this desert, and man, it's tight. <laughs> They'd been like, okay, right, let's go turn around, let's go. I mean, he already had people want to go back. He would have had most of them, like, trudging back, talking about, we're sorry, Pharaoh, can we come back? <laughs> we'll, make, we'll make brick without even clay from now on. <laughs> Huh? Nobody wants that. Nobody wanted Douglas, General Douglas MacArthur to say, eh, 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 to say, well, I guess we lost that one, boys. I guess we, we can give that up to the Japanese and they'll never, we'll never get back here. No, he stood there right in that water, hip deep, and he said, I'm coming back. 
And when I come back, y'all better watch out because I'm coming back. And these guys are like, yeah, we're coming back, y'all. We might have to leave right now, but we're coming back. Huh? Nobody wants to hear the, 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 the leader say, I, I don't know. Nobody wants to hear that. They want to hear, I have a plan. When things get tight and things look like they're falling apart, they want to hear the leader say, I have a plan. Don't worry about this. Keep your eye on the prize. There's a promised land over there. That's where we're going. Don't let this little hiccup get you. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And those in apostolic ministry, that's their function. That's their job, is to tell you. Maybe they don't, hey, you know, they, they may not know what's over there on the other side of that hill, but bless God, they know that God is able. They know that God has put them out there for a reason. And they know that when they step across there, there's something good over there. They don't know where it's at necessarily. They don't know what it is, but they know there's something good. And they have to encourage people, come on, there's some good on the other side. Let's go, let's go get it. That's ours for the taking. You know, when, when, when uh, uh, the, the folks came and took all, a zigzag and, and took, all David's, the, took all David's and his boy's stuff and their families and their kids and everything else, and they cried. Now, these are strong. These are the mighty men. David's mighty, killing hundreds of people, killing giants. And yet they're sitting there crying like babies. What are we going to do? Then they, they were even talking about killing David. David just went to the Lord and said, Lord, just tell me what to do. Do we go get our stuff or what? God said, go get your stuff. He came back and said, y'all shut up for a minute. Quiet down. Quit crying. Quit moaning. Quit groaning. Quit. Stop. Huh? What? 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 Get your stuff together. Okay. Let's go get our stuff. Huh? Let's go get our stuff. What are you crying about? Your children and your wives are over there, right? Yeah, let's go get them. That's what, that's what those who are gifted by the Holy Ghost, that's what they do. That's how they are. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what you look for. And you have a right to look for that. And guess what? When that person is gone, when Moses died, they didn't sit there and say, well, I guess we'll never get in the promised land now because Moses is dead. Who stepped up? Who stepped up? Joshua. Who was Joshua during Moses' lifetime? Who was Joshua to Moses? He was his servant. He was his armor bearer. He was the one that walked him to the mountain. So when he went up to the mountain to talk to God, he'd walk part way up. Then he'd stand and he'd sit there and wait for Moses until he got done talking with God and, and came down. That's who Joshua was. Joshua was a faithful man to the man of God. When the man of God went someplace, Joshua was right there. Moses didn't take a step without Joshua taking a step with him. And then when God called Moses up to the mountain and said, hey, look, because of your sin, you've got to die now. You, it's time for you to go. He said, you can see the promised land, but you never step foot in it. And Moses died. Where was Joshua? He wasn't up on top of the mountain, but he was halfway up there waiting on Moses to come down. But Moses wasn't coming down. But then the Lord spoke to Mo uh, Joshua and said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now get up and let's get these folks into the promised land. And Joshua stepped right in. And nobody said, well, he's not fit. He's not this. He's not that. No, nobody said the words. You know why? Because Moses had trained a leader. He had trained his replacement. He had raised up someone who was just as good as he was. And when he raised him up, when the time came, God said, okay, Joshua, step in. Joshua stepped in. Wasn't a, they, didn't, they didn't miss a beat, didn't miss a moment. Went over to the Jordan. They took the lands that were around that Jordan area and then said, okay, here we are, Lord. And uh, guess what? Just like Moses and the water split at the Red Sea, guess what happened? The water split at the uh, River Jordan. The, mo the, the water split at the river Jordan. It wasn't as big as the Red Sea, but in other words, they saw God is with him. And they took the promised land under Joshua's leadership, but guess whose vision it was? Moses. Where did Moses get the vision? From God. 
Joshua didn't say, hey, change the leadership, change the plan. We're not going into the promised land. We're going over to this other land over here. No, he said, we're going there. Because that's where we're supposed to go. That's where we're going. That's where Moses brought us, and I'm going to take us the rest of the way. If something happened to me, who, who among you would stand up and say, let's go. Pastor said, this is what we're supposed to do. This is where we're supposed to be going. This is what we've got to do. We're going to put churches in Indianapolis, and we're going to put churches in Louisville, Kentucky. We're going to put one in Atlanta, Georgia. We're going to raise up and take this neighborhood. Come on, let's complete that vision. Who's going to do that? Well, I can tell you this. I got several people who will be able to do that. And this church wouldn't miss a beat. It's not supposed to. Is not supposed to. In apostolic ministry, you have to take a risk. Did we take a risk coming from Grand Rapids to here? Of course we did. Did we step out into the unknown? Of course we did. We had no idea what Fort Wayne held for us, but it didn't matter because guess what? God said go. We were going. He told me. I told you guys. He didn't tell you. He told me. I told you. Well, until we hear from God ourselves, I'm just telling you, I'm just saying. They have influence. They're influential. They influence people's lives, influence communities. They're influential in the areas and, 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 and things around them. Influential, probably, and in some cases, in governments. Influential in, 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 in other churches and other pastors' lives. Influential. We'll say something that other pastors will grab hold to and say, man, that's, that's a word from the Lord. I got that. I had a guy, pastor here, tell me, I had said some things to him. I think I told you this. I said, you know, that God is about to do something great here, and, and, and I kind of went into some detail. And he said, man, he, said, he came later. He said, Pastor, I've been, I've been quoting you. He said, I, I've been saying this, the same thing you've been saying over to everybody I, I know because you're so, you're so right. See, that's, that's being influential. It's not, that, it's not that, oh, I'm better than him. It has nothing to do with that. It's just there, in that office, there is an influence that when you say something because it's from the Lord and it, is, it's, it resonates in the hearts and lives of other people and they grab hold to it, even other leaders, they grab hold to it and they say, yes, that is so true. Yeah, let me get on board with that. Let me get on that bandwagon. They're impactful. They have, how, how, much did, how much did Paul impact the lives of the people in Thessalonica, in Ephesus, Colossus? Come on, I mean, you, know, I mean, we, you, you, you can name you, every place there, and there other places, even Rome. Influence. He had inf this guy was so awesome. He had influence among the dignitaries. Other, so, some of the higher-ups want to just come, come. I just want to hear you talk. I heard that you were just so, I just want to hear what you have to say. What did one, one leader say? One, one, one guy said, look, he said, you've almost got me convinced I ought to be saved. Paul was like, that's the point. <laughs> that's the whole point of this. I'm not here just so you can hear me all right. I'm here so that you can turn your life around. That's a gifting from God, folks. It's a gifting from God. And those in apostolic ministry have to have a boldness because if they don't, that gifting is, is not going to go very far. But they have to have a boldness. You have to have a boldness to say something that nobody else is saying, to declare something nobody else has declared. To step out and, 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 and say it boldly enough that other people say, wow, it resonates in their spirit. That's apostolic ministry. The Bible says this, to whom much is given, much is required. There's a lot required. Now, and the reason 
I, wanna, I want you to understand something. The reason I place this with all the other gifts and not separating as so many do, the ministerial gifts, because it's all still gifting of the Holy Ghost. And just like any gift of the Spirit, it has to operate along the Holy Ghost guidelines. It has to operate along the Holy Ghost guidelines. You can pervert, uh, 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 pervert that gift. You can. People have done it. Many people have done it. But if you operate it correctly, you raise up a group of people who are empowered by the Holy Ghost, gifted, all going in one direction, and they will accomplish much. And not just in a short period of time, but over the long haul. Because that's what it's all about. It's not about just accomplishing something today, this week, or this year, but over a lifetime and beyond. The children of Israel got into the promised land and it was, not, it was not just Moses' 40 years that, you know, from 80 to 120, but it also took some years from Joshua, too. That was a long-term vision, wasn't it? Just to get into the promised land. Then once in the promised land, it gets set up with tribal lands and this and that and all the other things that they had to do and everything, else, all, that was all part of the vision. Having the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle, where that sets up, all, those, all that long-term, long-range and, and if you notice and if you read, you'll find out it became more refined as they pressed further in. It became more refined as they pressed further in. And that's what you find about our vision. It'll become more refined as we press further in. As we get this done and that done, then it becomes refined. It becomes, the, the focus becomes more narrower and more narrower. And that, and, and that doesn't mean just uh, we're throwing things off. No, what it simply means is we're becoming more refined. And then, and then what God has, you know, wants and, and, and his desire for this ministry and his plan will become, and when it comes to fruition and continues to come to fruition, because it's not just, okay, we're done now. No, it goes on until Jesus comes back. But as it continues to go, and if you look at the uh, uh, nation of Israel, it's the same way. They became a nation, right? They left all that behind them of Egypt and uh, all that, and they, were in the pro they became a nation, had kings. But guess what? Now that meant that the vision became more refined. Because way back, way back, way back when they were still in the wilderness, when God had them write the Levitical rules, he said something about them. He said that they were to become a kingdom of priests. Remember that? And all the way through, wasn't that what God was showing them that they were supposed to be? He was refining that vision of being a kingdom of priests all the way through, all the way through. Even today, that's what they're supposed to be doing. And he was refining that part of the vision. He was refining that thing, making it more clear, more clear, more clear, giving them more opportunity to become that. So the church is the same way. We have the vision. What are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? That's the role of the apostle. That's why apostles are here today. No, we're not the apostles. I'm not the apostle of the Lamb on the original 12. I'd be an old, old, very old, 2,000-year-old man if that were the case. No, of course not. But the apostolic anointing is here, still here today, because we still need that kind of leadership. Amen? Amen. We'll stop right there. I didn't even get a chance to get in any other area, but we'll stop right there. Praise God. I hope that was a blessing to you and helped you out.